And give it up for Chris Rodriguez. Hi, here for how you doing? Us. Are these on? I don't, can you hear us? They okay? are. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So nice and quiet. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and watching the first episode of our crazy little show. <laughs> what, was this the uh, first time seeing it for for anyone here? Okay. Yeah. All right. So you got a nice taste of a very Mrs. small Crumble. taste of Miss Crumble. Um, yes, the teacher. But you are in for a treat once you continue with the ten episodes because your character gets a little crazy. Yes, uh, quite crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We actually meet her again in the second episode, um, but we don't know that it's her because she has become a ghouly witch with a traumatic brain injury, um, who can barely string together sentences and eats pillow stuffing and bugs and keys and doll heads and all kinds of things. <laughs> and so she um, she gets discovered living in the mall and the uh, this Josh and uh, uh, Angelica and Wesley are in the mall and they find her and she tries to eat them. And then they find out uh, that I'm a good witch. <laughs> are you a good witch or a bad witch? And I'm a good witch. And so... Um, they decide to study me, to keep me in their ranks a little bit, to study me, because if they can figure out why I became the way I am, maybe they can solve the ghouly problem um, and figure out what turned the adults into ghoulies. But, um, so yeah, it's a lot. we go on a big journey. And uh, I think we have some photos. No, we do. Are we able to show those? Are we gonna, no, we don't have any? Oh no. Okay. L you, you can look them up at home, but uh, yeah. it is quite the get up, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, well I, I am curious, what, what goes through your head when you are presented with a character that at first seems like a pretty standard high school teacher, mm -hmm. and then you realize down the line you have so much to play with. It's so over the top, so fantastical. Um, so what were your initial thoughts when presented the script? Um, well, when I was presented the script, it was actually more about the witch. Okay. So the, I got to see that first, which was the scarier part where I thought, uh, when I, I did my audition, I did part of Miss Crumble first, and I was like, well, I understand this. This is easy. And then they're like, okay, now <laughs> play this other character who's trying to eat Josh's finger. Um, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what any of that is. So, um, so I sort of just took a risk and um, it's funny as I hear most of the cast like now that we've been together for a year and we've been doing press for the release of the show they keep asking us about our audition stories and I found that most of the the um, actors were cast from self tapes there were very few that actually went into the room they cast a very wide net all over the country and and internationally I mean uh, you saw Sam Dean Sophie Simnet is from London um, and sh we were all cast off self tape and I think that partly why that might be the case is because these characters are so um, out there in a way you know they're they're larger than life and they require you to have a very little self awareness of like or self consciousness, you know? And so we were in our living rooms putting on something where if I had to walk into a room with a casting director, I might be a little more timid, but I just grabbed a handful of pistachios and shoved them in my mouth and like let the nut shells just fall out of my mouth and I sent it to my agent and I said don't ever show this to anybody and um, he was like I'm going to hold this over you for the rest of your life and now in 191 countries right. people are watching it now so so he doesn't have to hold it over someone leaked it yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I love that you mentioned that this show gives you the opportunity to be larger than life yeah um, you of course have such a rich background in theater um, what, one of the general directions when people are making that transition from st stage to screen is to play it a little more yes. subtle, a little yes. smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so is this a unique on-camera experience for it, you? It definitely is. I mean, when I, I went to NYU for uh, theater as my major, and uh, I remember our first day of school, they said, uh, we want to teach you to be, an, um, like, we're going to teach you the classics, the, the Shakespeare's and the... Um, Chekhov's and all of that, and we're gonna teach you Oklahoma and musicals and things because we don't think there's such thing as TV acting and theater acting, there's good acting and bad acting. So I, I still feel that way. I think that is very smart because anything can be 
uh, larger than life if it's grounded in reality. And so you just have to find the reality of the people's situation. So it is very different on TV to be able to play something like this, especially a character that's going to continue for seasons, potentially, not just someone who comes in to, like, ragu, you know, like, scare somebody and then leave and you never see them again. We actually had to develop this character that you would maybe want to watch for a long time. So, um, so it started with me going through you know, basically at her core, I mean, you guys haven't seen her, but she's nuts. And, um, but at her core, she has a traumatic brain injury. She has a dissociative personality disorder. So it, that was something real I could grab onto so that even when I'm eating, you know, all kinds of weird things or I can open my jaw very wide, like there's all kinds of weird, like stuff that goes on with me. Um, I could ground it in some sort of reality. Yeah. So. Yeah, w was that important to kind of do that pre-character research? I mean, you're, you're talking about like a disassociative yeah. uh, kind of thing. So you did your research. I did my research that. on that. I also had an acting coach who, um, because honestly, I just, uh, once I put that on tape, they called me three days later and offered me the job. And in a few weeks, I was moving to Albuquerque to shoot the whole series. So I was like, uh, I don't know how to do this at all. Like this was just a one-off sort of, throw something silly on camera and you know th maybe no one will ever see it and so i i took the script and the sides to my uh, to an acting coach and we worked on the reality of the situation we worked on the physicality we worked on sort of you know this bomb has gone off has does the witch now hear frequencies differently? Like there was all kinds of, does the ground rumble in a way that has been tectonically shifted? There were like things that we were able to kind of discuss in a very serious way that no one else is willing to have that conversation with you, you know? So you get that really weird actor brain. And then I show up on set and they're like, just more dirt and like, get your, you know, get your hands in there, lick the stuff off the floor. And so like all of that stuff comes on top of me having to feel like I know who this person really right, is right. so that I feel safe to be like, great. Yeah. I'll lick that blood off the floor. Let's do it. You know, I never said no to anything and they never said like, oh, whoa, okay, that's too weird right. at anything I suggested. So that was fun. I bet that's not necessarily what you envisioned when you decided to become an actor. Though, no, no, not at all. And like definitely this. not when I became an actor of a certain age. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I have spent a lot of my career playing a certain type of character and I spent a lot of time in the last couple years deciding that I wanted to play women. I wanted to play women with um, with real uh, stakes and issues and things that I could dig my sink my teeth into. And this did not strike me as something that that was going to be, you know, when you get presented this teen Netflix show um, about the apocalypse and you're the teacher, you know, you're the the crazy person is like, well, I don't know if that's really going to be who I want to play for that long. But then it actually ended up being one of the more um, fulfilling kind of roles that I've gotten to play because what I realized I was missing in so many other roles prior was the ability to get dirty. Like, you know, literally and figuratively, but really like sink my teeth into something that required mind body a holistic approach to this role which you don't always get to do when the role sort of resembles yourself a bit or um or when you know you're not a big enough part of the show where you can kind of carry that emotional weight so it turns out she's like amazing I she's a favorite role I've ever played she's got like a lot um, of depth to her. She has trauma. She has humor. She's a real woman finding her, you know, her place in the world. And and what you see in the first episode is that the apocalypse isn't necessarily the worst thing that's happened to all these kids. Like, they're getting a new start in life. And that's also the same for Miss Crumble, which you see in the first episode. She's dealing with these students who don't respect her, who are falling asleep, who are telling jokes. You know, it gets worse as time goes on. And she's disillusioned as a teacher. And somehow, even as she becomes this witch with in this trauma, she finds her new voice, which is more important. Yeah, I love that. I, I mean, the, the journey through the whole the whole series is, uh, is just so much to play with. It's You'll have to check it out, yeah, guys. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> um, I am curious to hear a bit more about this kind of uh, shifting gears for you wanting to pursue different kinds of roles in your career. Yeah. Um, what inspired that? And uh, how do you really go about consciously 
navigating something like that? You don't work for a while. <laughs> That's how you go about doing it. You don't make any money for a whole year. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how it ended up for me, at least. Um, I had been, uh, you know, you start. I started my career quite early. I made my Broadway debut when I was 19. So at that point, when you're just sort of breaking into the industry, everything feels like the thing you need to do. Like, you're not going to say no to most jobs. You're going to do that Broadway show, even if it's a flop. You're going to do that next thing. You're just trying to find your own kind of niche in the business. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Then I found a very comfortable niche. And then I hit 30. And, you know, it sounds like it's not like 30 is old by any stretch of the imagination. But you start to hit that, like, middle ground where you can't really play a a young person anymore, but you're not quite the mom, so you're sort of in this middle ground, and where that middle ground tends to lead you is like the quirky best friend or the hot bartender that like, you know, there's kind of these like tropes. There's also like Officer Martinez. There's like very specific things that you fit into. And I, I started to realize that like a lot of it was like the long suffering wife where the, you know, oh, the kind of king of queens wife who's like, mm, this guy all the time. And watching the man get to make mistakes and be funny and be endearing and be all these things while the woman's sort of the buzzkill of the relationship. Um, a lot of the like Walter White syndrome where the wife is like, ah, how come you don't want your husband selling meth? What a, what a villain you are in right. this television series. And you're like, whoa. Okay, so you're kind of, all of a sudden I was faced with a sort of inherent, what I believe to be misogyny of these roles, and I decided, like, I, I'm just going to see what happens if I only play parts that, you know, where the first line is not pretty, or the first adjective about her is not, like, you know, smarter than it, the smartest woman in the room, but no one knows it. Like, that was a lot of that. And I was like, no, I want to be the smartest woman in the room and everybody knows it. Or I want, you know, I want to be like the one who's making the mistakes and figuring it out. And then you love her anyway, even though she's messy and, um, and like, and, you know, makes questionable boyfriend decisions or all of that. You want to love her anyway, you know? So uh, that's the long version of I was presented with a role that I felt did not do that. And it was a big role that could have made my life very easy. And I decided not to do it. And I did an experiment for a year. And I did a lot of, I did my first off-Broadway play. I did my first um, thing at the Kennedy Center. Like m really great things started coming in all roles that I wanted to do. But, you know, off-Broadway theater is like the least lucrative thing you can do <laughs> as an actor. So it got a little bit like, well, when do I, when do I give up on this experiment when I have to pay rent? And, um, and then Daybreak came along. And I did not think this was, th I truly, and my agent's here, he can attest, I did not think that this was going to be the thing that broke that streak. And it turns out like it was exactly what I, what I was looking for, is that this woman is the one making, getting just, you know, her, her hands dirty and, and being funny and being tragic and being lovable and being a villain at some points. And like all of these things all rolled into one whose, whose cohort in the show, I hook up like as a partner with Angelica. So I'm the oldest person on the show with the youngest person on the show and the two women get to make the part really the biggest difference in the whole sort of storyline you'll see as you go along. So it was, it was amazing to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and uh, you mentioned kind of the scene partners that sh you're sharing the screen with. You are so out there that even if they are kind of distinct and goofy characters in themselves, they are kind of straight manning you yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm curious, what makes a good scene partner in that kind of situation? How, how do you kind of negotiate that with the person you're acting with? Well, um, Olivia, who plays Angelica, is 12 years old, um, and she is one of the best actresses <laughs> I've ever worked with. She is, she's Emmy nominated. She was on Young and the Restless for a few years. Uh, we were talking about how I didn't finish college, and some of the other kids were like, yeah, I didn't finish high school. And she was like, oh, I'm a preschool dropout. Um, she dropped out of preschool. Her mom is a, is a very well-known actress. She has three two sisters who are also well-known actresses. They're a whole family of 
the identical looking actress. <laughs> um, but her, but what's great about working, you know, I was a little wary. I'm like, I'm the only adult and there's all these kids and like, what are they gonna be like? And turns out, I don't know what any of them are saying. I, uh, that happened. I didn't think that was gonna happen, but I need a translator for all of them. Um, but with Olivia, she, um, she's so young that she is an absolute channel for the emotions. She has not overthought it. She is not insecure about it. She is a perfect vessel for whatever emotion needs to come out. She has this open face that just, you like you look into the eyes and you're like, I could do anything. I can, I can react to whatever you are giving me because it's pure. And, um, and that's a gift. And so I had a great time like looking deep into her eyes and like saving the world with her. Um, and and what's great is uh, something that you didn't you don't get to see is that the first two episodes are narrated by Josh, but as the series go goes on, they change narrators every episode. So it isn't just told from the point of view of this one young male character. Um, I get an episode where it's my point of view, and uh, Angelica, Wesley, Turbo. Um, Principal Burr, all of us get our own um, episodes. So they're and they're all told from a different style. So there's a samurai episode. There's one told entirely in subtitles. There is one in the idea of Goodfellas. Mine is a all that jazz meets uh, television sitcom uh, mixture. All the fractured parts of the witch's brain. So stay tuned for more storytelling. That's, that's a lot of fun. yeah, that's, that's very different. Um, well, final question before opening it up to some audience questions. Um, this obviously is such a such a highlight in in your career thus far. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of credits in TV and theater. What do you hope to be doing next? Well, I hope to be doing another season of Daybreak. Yeah. First of all, that would be really fun. We haven't gotten that notice yet, but um, but I really enjoyed playing this character. From there. Um, uh, honestly, I'm, I've dipped my toe into producing a bit, and I would like to tell my own stories or other people's stories who are uh, underrepresented, uh, which I think is a cool, that sort of clicked into my mind in that year where I didn't do as much acting as I normally do, um, where people are always like, well, if you're dissatisfied, then write it. But I, I didn't ever really want to be a writer, and I felt a little bit like, is that like saying, like, I just want to be a housewife? If I'm like, I just want to be an actor. I just want everyone to tell me what to do. Is that okay? Um, and then it, what it clicked to me is that um, actually the producer has more creative control all the way through the end of a project, whereas a writer will write something, maybe hand it over to a group of people and they don't really have any say in it, um, that if I could produce things that I also could act in, that maybe um, maybe we would get to see different kinds of characters. So I think that's on the forefront um, in indie film is where I'm hoping to go, and that would be um, the dream is to just uh, keep going in these roles. Maybe one that fulfills that little itch that I have that isn't covered in dirt and have like rotting teeth. Um, but you know, wh whatever it is, I'll do it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's certainly exciting things in the future. Um, Thanks. before we wrap up here, I just wanted to give everyone here the opportunity to ask Krista some questions. Do we have any questions about daybreak or otherwise? Yes, sir. That's fine. Oh, great. Great. Uh, it's wild. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, okay. Just, just for the recording, mm -hmm. um, you're asking about Hercules, how it all came together. Yes. Um, to tell us about it. It was a great So this summer, summer, every year, the public theater does a summer of free theater at the Delacorte in Central Park. And they usually do Shakespeare. And, uh, and then one production a year is with the association with Public Works, which is the public theater's sort of community outreach program. They have different, uh, they partner with different organizations throughout the five boroughs. Um, some of them are organizations like uh, Children's Aid, some are Veterans uh, Associations, some are um, help after being released from prison. There are um, the Brownsville Recreational Center. There's all of these community centers throughout the, the um, the area that the public works in conjunction with doing arts uh, programs throughout the year. So at the end of the year, during the summer, they do a big production of something with these community members who all audition, but there are sometimes upwards of 250 um, cast members of these shows. So 
in the past years, they've done like Cymbeline or like different sort of Shakespeare things. The last two years, they did original musicals written by Shana Taub, who's like this great and really um, breakthrough female um, writer. And then this year, they decided to do the Disney musical Hercules, which had never been adapted for the stage before. So um, I got to play Meg, which is like the dream Disney princess. She's not really a princess. She's a goddess. Um, and, uh, and I got to do that, which was awesome. And we did it in the park. There's seven um, union members, equity members, and then the rest of the cast is filled in with um, these community members who audition. So 250 people on stage. There's um, also cameo groups, which means they take um, sort of different groups throughout the area too to do little um, cameos in it. So we had a marching band. We had um, uh, Broadway inspirational voices. We had a puppetry core. We had all kinds of things. So it's an enormous thing, and it all gets put up in less than a month. <laughs> and there's only seven performances, um, and it's free. So um, it was this enormous sort of uh, ticket just juggernaut. Everyone wanted a seat, and because it's free, they do a lotto. So there were, I think the first day we opened to the lotto, there were 75,000 entries into the lotto. I mean, it's like crazy. So it was a it was a huge sort of experience. It was a New York experience. It, it's the definition of community theater. It's bringing in people from everywhere for the people, by the people. And um, it was a really amazing experience. It was slapdash. I mean, it was like fast and furious. We put that thing up so fast. So the equity actors had been developing the show for about a year and a half, working on script workshops so that it was settled by the time we brought in 250 other people to like, you know, get working on that. So it's a really special thing. Working in the Delacorte alone is just a magic. Being in Central Park, doing theater in an open air situation with 1,400 or, four, no, it's more than that. It's a lot of seats, two something thousand seats. I can't remember. Um, uh, so that's already special, but then add in getting to know these people who are not just non-professional actors, they're just, they're regular people. Like it's not, you know. So to watch them sort of come into their own and get that affirmation is really a special experience. It, it really is kind of a, a singular New York experience. Totally. New York theater, it's pretty magical. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and speaking of headstrong, confident women, Meg is kind of quintessential yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, she is. She And this was 20 years ago, so yeah. imagine like what she could be now, and that's what we wanted to do, is even deepen that sort of um, strength that she has in this, this new era. Yeah, cool. Well, well, we'll take one more question here. Yes, sir? Yes. Yes. So um, so the question was about uh, what can we see about the backstory of the witch in later episodes when I narrate. So yes, my episode is episode seven, and it is told half of the pre-apocalypse, half of the post-apocalypse. So you get a lot of backstory. You get to discover why the witch is who she is. Um, you get to discover... Um, that I can sing. <laughs> There's a little singing in it. Um, so uh, yeah, you'll, you, you, it's a deep dive into the witch. And you get a little bit of it throughout the other episodes, but this is all out, like really the crux of her origin story, which is, um, which is great. You get a little bit of an episode two when you see the witch for the first time. They flash back to, to show that it's Miss Crumble, and uh, you get a little bit of her origin story there. but. Yeah, you'll get a whole lot of information in episode seven. So stick it out till then. Yeah, and it, it's like a Ben Platt on the politician. If Netflix is going to take these Broadway folks, they better get them singing. Better make them sing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, the the role sang before I was cast. They didn't even do it because I was cast. It was um, she is in a uh, Latina all mo all female Morrissey cover band. <laughs> so we sing Morrissey songs in Spanish. Um, and so that's uh, that was part of her backstory, was that that was her kind of um, her life outside of teaching. And she decide she has to decide whether she gets mercilessly made fun of enough to quit that passion that she has as well. And go to teaching. And go to teaching, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Krista, thanks for joining us today. Thank thanks you. Thanks for joining us. Thank yeah. you guys so much. And I hope you watch the show and enjoy it. <laughs>